that um, that are demanding it. So it's, it's an interesting it's an interesting trend. And the reason I you know, the reason I bring it up is I think people are now connecting the dots. They're like, do I really want to support a company that pollutes? You know, before it was not very evident. You know, companies did pay and and um, you know people weren't really judging how companies produce things. There's a the negative externality. Now people are really conscious. You know, I mean, most fish now in the sea have plastic in their bellies, and you know, so you know, if companies like I think a great company that I think I'm going to invest in if it pops up is a company that just sells beverages with glass containers. You know, we, we got to wean ourselves off of plastic, not just in Guatemala but worldwide. It's a major problem. But it's, re it's really going to be hard for a CEO that produces a lot of garbage to say, I'm for the environment. You know, <coughs> young people, especially your age, are getting a lot smarter. And they really kind of can see through if a CEO is being authentic or not. So that's, that's a big... Um, and you know, the, the companies like, you know, the companies that are, you know, producing good products that uh, take care of the environment are doing really well. Like I, aside from Ecofiltro, I'm an organic coffee farmer. So in Antiwa, I produce coffee and I sell it in Asia. And um, we're a Rainforest Alliance and we've seen that, you know, I mean you still have to go out and market your product, you gotta get on the plane and go to Korea and Japan, but people really value um, your product if you're taking care of the environment. And I think more and more um, companies that really are concerned for their workers and the environment are going to receive, uh, you know, premiums, premium pricing. Like we, nobody believes this, but you know, the market price for coffee is about a dollar or two dollars. I don't even know what it is now, but we get seven to nine dollars in green, not roasted. I mean, it's like the, it's the most well-paid coffee in Guatemala. I mean, it's a very small farm. It's quince manzanas, but you know, people really respect you if you do a good job with with your farm and the environment. You know, and, and so that's what I always talk when I talk to co coffee farmers. They're always hesitant to do what I did. I'm like, look, not only is it good for the environment and good for the people because you can pay them more, but you know, it's financially profitable. It's hard for you to get certified. Yeah, it does take a while. So it's a, yes. it's a lot of paperwork and it takes about uh, three to four years yeah, to get USDA organic and rainforest alliance. By MySert? By MySert, yeah. So we're, we're certified by MySert and, um, and rainforest alliance. And we have others that are less well known. But the, the point I wanted to make, because you know, I want to focus on Nicofiltro, is that you know, there's a whole trend. People that are doing the right thing, not only is it good, humanistically, but the marketplace is starting to reward them. And I think that's a good trend, you know, because sometimes you read the paper here and it's all negative. I'm like, this is all going to be positive, this talk today. <laughs> and I, think there, I think there's a lot of good things, um, you know, happening in the world. And so what I did was, so I came back to Guatemala uh, 15 years ago, and um, my, my mother and my sister have been, in, my, my sister's a social worker. And um, they were involved in helping people in nutrition and water for many, many years. And, um, you know, they got involved in water because, you know, one out of 20 kids don't reach the age of five. Um, there's, I mean, it's one of the biggest issues. If you go to the big hospitals here and you ask the doctors, why are the kids, you know, if the kids are on a hospital bed, They'll always say, "Ah, we need to study this thing." You know, a stomach illness. Like it's very. I mean, the the um, the biggest problem here is bacteria fecal origin. So you know, if bacteria fecal origin was fluorescent, and you're sitting on the moon, and you're looking at Guatemala from the moon, Guatemala would look like Las Vegas. You know, I mean, it's just it's everywhere. It's in the rivers, the lakes. Uh, Ninety-seven percent of the rivers in the lakes have bacteria because you know, we don't have. Uh, treat water treatment plants. We don't have, um, you know, we, we, we don't do a good job of um, separating the drainage in, in the cities. And so everything mixes up when it gets. So it's a big issue. 
So my mom and sister, for many years, they focused on that as a foundation. And um, they started out with chlorination programs because chlorination is really cheap and it's really effective. But there's one problem with chlorination. What is it? The taste. Yes. Smart person. You know, in London, in Washington, in New York, they were sending tons of containers to Central America of chloro. But you know how many families would use it over time? You know, after three months of implementing a chlorination program in their home, how many out of 100 families, how many would continue to use it? <coughs> three. Three percent. Is that a good, is that a good program? No. So, my sister did this forever. She got tired of doing it. She says this is a big waste of time. And she met this Guatemalan called Fernando Mazarieros. <coughs> Fernando Mazarieros. He's, he's the inventor of, he's from Panacachet. He's the inventor of ceramic pot filtration. And he was giving a talk. My sister was there in the front row. And he started off his talk um, saying, you know, from the time of the Egyptians, the Romans, <coughs> the Mayans, the Mayans of this region, they've always stored water in what? In ceramic pots. Why? Why in ceramic pots? No, because it keeps fresh. Exactly. So my sister was, you know, this guy who was talking about this new development of this water filter starts talking about cultures of other countries, and she was fascinated because she'd gone through this process of coordination where nobody, it was being promoted by all these USAID and the local government. And it wasn't working, and he was he was kind of <coughs> talking about cultural issues, which were very important. And so he talked about how clay and water were always um, intertwined, married in most cultures. And then he talked about the technology and how effective it was, and how it won these prizes all over the world. And so she went and talked to him for about an hour after, and then she basically hijacked him, and she said, "I I really need to talk to you because." You know, we've been trying to solve the water problem in Guatemala, <coughs> but we've had no success because you no know, one likes chlorine. And, and, and he said, well, why don't we do a study? So she had Landiva University here, a Harvard professor, uh, Pan American Health Foundation, and like two or, two or three other big organizations. And they, they went and did a huge test. One, to see if the filter worked, and two, what the cultural acceptance would be. And after two years, the conclusion was it was extremely effective at reducing intestinal infection, but most importantly, people drank, they doubled their intake of water. They loved the water. The comments and the anecdotes were, it is como el agua mi abuela. You know, people, people really liked it because it was so fresh. So my sister, my sister and my mother, you know, found the technology, but the big, the big issue and this is what it looks like here. You know, it's a it's a it's a clay pot that can go in any receptacle, and you put dirty water in there, and it it filters two liters an hour, and it's and it's very it's very very effective. <coughs> but the issue that my mother and my sister had resolved was, so they would raise donations and they would give two thousand filters away every year. So when I turned forty, and you know, I started having less tomorrows than yesterdays. You know, I said, it's time for me to, you know, all I, all I had done was, done was make lots of money in my life. I said, you know, I want to do something for humanity. And when I went to look at my mother's foundation, you know, and then I went to, to the users, sometimes you'd see the filter being used as a garbage can, as a flower pot, sometimes in the box, because there, no, there was no interaction. It was just like, like how many companies do, they just dump, they just dump products in the community, right? They're like, hey, I'm here to help you. And, um, and I was like, that doesn't work. You know, I visited three villages. And I'm like, the, the model, the, the, the technology is good, but the model is wrong. I mean, many people were using it and they were very happy. But it wasn't sustainable. You know, it wasn't sustainable to give it away. So what I did, what I did, and, I, and, and you know, I, I went and I analyzed, and I went, to, I went to all these communities and I went to ask them, so what do you do to purify your water? And some people said, well, we buy bottled water. You know, other people said, we buy lots of firewood. And then I started asking, so what do you, what do you spend? What do you spend on bottled water? What do you spend on firewood? 
And the magic number, it ended up being that the poorest of the poor, in most rural areas, they were spending $13 to $15 a month, either on bottled water or firewood, to boil water. And so I said, okay, if I, if I reduce the price of the Ecofiltro to a point where they can pay it off in three months, they're going to buy it, right? You know, they're going to they're gonna be able to buy it, you know? And I noticed a lot of them had, you know, cell phones, and you started seeing radios and TVs, and they had, you know, little money didn't mean no money. They had the capacity to pay stuff, but you had to, you had to really converse with them. Instead of being like an NGO and dumping things on them, you had to have this really sincere conversation. And that's how it all started. And so, and so here's, you know, here's a picture of, you know, in Guatemala. In Guatemala ranks like number one or two in the world for consumption of firewood per capita. I mean, we consume, when an ecofiltro goes into a household, the family burns 21 pounds less of firewood a day if they don't boil water. So it's really, it's really dramatic. And the impact is huge. You know, you save a ton of trees. But, you know, what I want to say, and I think this is, you know, one of the main points of the conversation is, okay, so there's not enough donations to reach a million families with clean water. So what I started doing is, I started going, I started going with my friends. I said, hey, you know, I, I started producing these beautiful ceramic receptacles and bottle receptacles, and I said, hey, if you buy this, it's going to cost you, you know, 50 or $100, you're spending $200 on bottled water, you're going to save a ton of money. In the first hundred, my friends were like, you want me to drink out of a flower pot? You're crazy. I mean, I like it, you're my cousin, but no thanks. So the first hundred, you know, the first hundred were really hard. The next thousand were a little easier. And, you know, in the last seven years, we've reached 112,000 urban families. So now, you know, the who's who of Guatemala, I even have a couple billionaires in the U.S. They have beautiful echo in their kitchens. But the reason I did the urban is, you know, like here the, the maracates, all the <coughs> rock stars, everyone has ecofiltros and sports stars. As I said, you know, if I can make money on the urban, then I can reduce the price to $35 on the rural, and I can provide payments. So I went at it in a different approach. Instead of depending on donations, I said, if I can create something that looks really good, that someone will be proud to have in their kitchen, and obviously that produces good quality water, then that will be enough to make it go. And so, thanks to these, you know, 112,000 urban customers, we have about 208,000 rural families. So, you know, when I said, okay, I'm going to do this, I told my mom I want to do this, but I want to do it not as a foundation, but as a social enterprise. Um, and, and actually, a little anecdote, my sister didn't talk to me for three months. She's like, they lost her in there, those pobres. You know, she was really angry with me. And I said, and her name is Dominique. I said, Dominique, right now, at the rate of 2,000 families a year, we're never going to solve anyone's problem, or it's not going to have a major impact. Since the reason I want to do it this way is because I really want to solve the problem, but I want to do it sustainably. So, but it's kind of interesting, in the world of development, there's a lot of like um, antagonism to doing things sustainably. Now she loves me, now she's on my board, and she thinks, she's like, why didn't I do this when I started, you know? She's my cheerleader number one. But there was a lot of, and in life, you know, you always get resistance. When you try to do things a different way, you know, you get, you get resistance. And my mom was like, social business, she was like, that's an oxymoron, you know? And everyone thought I was a little crazy. But you have to be crazy if you want to change the world. So, so anyway, so that's basically, you know, what I did at Ecofiltro is, is um, you, know, I, you know, I just went and I marketed to people. And, and I tell you, those first hundred, I almost quit. Because I had so many people telling me, I'm not going to drink out of, a, out of a flower pot. Even though I would, and these were like my cousins. But I stuck with it, and I got really, really good at marketing graphically. And then, you know, the, just the wheel started turning. And it was really important, like, um, it was really important to focus on the value of the filter. Because at first I started saying, if you buy this, I'm going to reach rural families, and it didn't re resonate. Or if you buy this, we're going to save the environment. But when I said, if you buy this, you're going to save a ton of money. I mean, in the back of my mind, I knew that the reason for doing this was to help the rural poor. But this was, this was the marketing volante that just made it take off.
I mean, all of a sudden we started getting we started getting so many orders that we couldn't produce enough. We have this model of barro. Uh, that the outside is barro. We started hiring all these artisans, but they couldn't keep up with the demand. But it all had to do with how we communicated, which was kind of it was kind of interesting. And in the and in the rural areas, no one had ever no one had ever gone to rural families to talk to them. Like in the world of development. You know, all, anything that had to do with water filters or clean cook stoves, they were like just dumping them. I mean, we saw we saw some families that had four different types of water filters that they were just good at receiving free things from foundations. You know, and, and I was like, God, this is crazy. You know, it kills the dignity of our people, and it doesn't solve their problem. You know, because there's never enough donations. So we did these really simple uh, flyers, and we would sit down with the families, and they would. They couldn't believe how much they were spending on firewood. They're like, oh, you know, because sometimes they're the only thing day to day in the council. You know, they only think of what they're spending day to day. But we would start saying, this is what you're spending a month, and they're like, oh my gosh. And so we started getting lots and lots of, um, of customers that way. And then there was a group. It wasn't the majority, but there was always out of a hundred families, five to ten that would do nothing. And so we would say, well, so how much do you spend on medicine? And it was like double what people were spending on bottled water. You know, it, it, there's, it's, it's really interesting. No one had ever really done the kind of marketing research that we did in rural areas. Because we were the first ones to talk to people. We were the first ones that were like, we're going to find out what's going on. And so I give a lot of talks now to social entrepreneurs in Guatemala that are looking at clean cook stoves and solar. And I, and I open up my books and I say, look, this is the ruta. And this is where we, and we failed a lot. <coughs> I didn't know what I was doing. I never sold anything in a rural area. But um, we mapped out exactly how you can solve a lot of social problems in a, a, a social enterprise. And, you know, we just opened an office in, um, in several countries in, in the region and we're just applying exactly what we learned here. And this is kind of a funny thing. Uh, when I was uh, your age, or many of you are this age, I, uh, I went to Wharton, which is a business school in the uh, University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And between my first and second year, they encourage you to get internships all over the world. So I went to Prague. I went to Eastern Europe, which was kind of cool back then. It was a frontier market. And when I would walk from my apartment to my job, I would pass this big university. And this big university always had this huge curtain that said Microsoft. And one day I went in. You know, I went into the university and it looked like a Microsoft store. Microsoft, their strategy of going into Eastern Europe was they were working with the universities and they were giving lots of stuff away, like software, <laughs> computers, in some, in some cases. <coughs> and so it dawned on me three years ago. I said, why don't I develop a strategy where I donate not to families but to schools? So we started this program where we want to donate one ecofiltro to every rural classroom in, in Guatemala. And I got a bunch of sponsors. Like I got Tigo, Visa, Coca-Cola, uh, the Swiss government. And in the last three years, we've reached uh, 1,600 rural schools and about 600,000 kids. Every, every month is about 90 new schools. Uh, you know, so we're scaling nicely. And, and, and something that's really cool about this is we created these ambassadors because kids hate boiled water. You know, it's kind of hot sometimes, it's dead water, it kind of tastes smoky. So all of a sudden, you know, we have about 610,000 of these little kids all over the place. They became our salespeople. So <laughs> all of a sudden, you know, they're the ones that, because we, when, we do, when we donate to a school, we talk about health and hygiene, importance of cleaning, your hands and importance of drinking purified water. So the ones that had parents that weren't doing anything, they're like, Papa, tú estás tomando agua con po, po. You know, I mean, we, we made them really sharp. And so that's how, you know, the school donations is what's gotten us into homes quickly. So it's kind of interesting, but I wish I would have done this seven years ago, you know, when I, when I started. So now all, you know, because we have lots of companies that want to, you know, they want to donate filters to the schools where their employees send their kids. And so, and so that's what we do. Like now in November, December, you know, it's uh, the summer or the vacations. So, so we have a gap there. But in January, we'll start 
Next year, we'll probably be going at the rate of about 150 schools a month. So, so the scale, the scale is really, uh, is really nice. <coughs> we try to, we, you know, we try to make things really cool. You know, we have all the most famous artists from Valens, Edwin Guillermo, Enrique Cali, all the cool graffiti artists, many from Zone One. Um, so we make, so we became not a not a water filter in urban homes, but a piece of art. You know, and so. Um, Right now we, right now we, um, in our in Mexico where we opened an office in January, we're selling filters that are painted by the most famous artists for eight thousand dollars. You know, and so believe it or not, people are like, I want one of those. So, you know, when when your when <clears throat> when your social objective is like really really um, impressive, you get all these people joining you. You know, like the malacates and you know. TV personalities, famous artists, they want to help you, you know, because you're trying to help people, in our case, get clean water. So it's kind of the cool thing about social business is you attract a lot of really cool people. I mean, you wouldn't believe the amount of people that come through my office. You know, like I had Barbara Padilla yesterday, you know, the one that went in Everest. You know, how can I help you? You know, and, and, and that's the cool thing of social, of social enterprise. And then we created, you know, cool models in Petrip, this is kind of cool. You've probably seen it. If you're from Antigua, have you seen these? Oh, para todos. Yes, of course. So, so this was the idea of my secretary, my assistant. My assistant said, you know, I'm from Antigua, and I notice kids are going into restaurants all the time asking for water. And many times they don't give them water. And so she said, why don't we do agua para todos? So it started by Juan and Luna and Miel. Uh, but it's I even covered it, you know, the next like a week later, you know, because the press is many times trying to cover good things that are happening in Guatemala. So the next day we had like 12 restaurants. Says, I want to be a part of all of our Now we're in, I think, 90 places. And we're coming into the city this uh, in December. You're going to start seeing them in uh, a lot of uh, coffee chains and stuff. So it's, it's basically water for everyone, you know. And um, Luna and Miel that started, the first day they gave out 300 uh, paper cups of water. So it shows you how thirsty, especially the kids. Many of them use the zapatos and, you know, people are really thirsty out there. So it's really important, like when you're running a business, especially in our case a social business, to always be doing things different, you know? I mean, okay, I mean, I personally believe water is a human right. I mean, it's really crazy. As a country, there's so many kids that don't have access to clean water. And so all of you pay for it because you have kids that, you know, their brains don't develop because they're sick all the time. Uh, the hospital expenses are great, so you always have all this need for medicine. So, you know, there's a, here's, an, here's an initiative that if we can make this worldwide, it started in Antigua, but now we're in Chela, we're gonna start in Guatemala. If we can, at least in the biggest cities, have water for everyone, that's 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 a way to help people too, especially the ones that are. Girls. And you know we're in Semaco. Um, one of the cool things of Semaco, you know, because I know the I know the owners of a lot of these companies, and you know they're always calling me and they want to do something with with Ecofiltro, and, and and I really appreciate it. But one of the things I really loved about Semaco is they're trying to live the corporate social responsibilities like they have it in their DNA. So like, you know, we're going to link the sale of the Ecofiltro to donating to rural schools. So it's kind of the first time in Guatemala you have a link up. Every everyone of like this model that gets purchased, um, we donate one to a rural school like, with, with San Marcos financial help. So if we can get more and more companies to do that, I think that's a real positive thing for the country. You know, and then we, you know, we had all these great uh, artists support it, and, and we sold it. So the filters um, at a very good, and, and this is this is the goal: a million families. So we're now at about 21 percent of the goal, um, and I have five years to reach a million. So I have to work my butt off. <laughs> the next, and this is the last uh, the last uh, slide here, um, and I think kind of the main point of my. Um, I mean, because Ecofilter is just one example of many. But one of the things that I found when I turned 40 is money doesn't bring you happiness. It's really helping others. And th this is the Maslow Triangle. Have you guys heard of the Maslow Triangle? Yes, okay. 
But you know that you know you have your basic needs of food and water. You can't live without those, right? But once you have that, you know, then your then your needs are more like being a part of a community, friends, family relations. But at the end of the day, you want to be. I mean, if you want to live a full life and a happy life, you want to try to get to the peak of this Maslow Triangle, which is fulfillment. And you can only get fulfillment by helping others. And trust me, I've made a ton of money, and then all of a sudden I'm 40 and I have all the money in the world, and I was like getting out of bed at 11 in the morning. It's like I had no purpose. You know, my God, I was sold this idea that it's all about making money. It really isn't. At the end of the day, what brings you happiness is helping others. And we can't escape it. That's how we're wired as human beings. As human beings, we're wired to help others. And that's what makes you happy. And my mom kind of brainwashed me when I was a kid. You know, when I was kind of feeling down, she was like, well, why don't you, we had a neighbor who was like 90 years old. She was like, why don't you go cut the grass of the, you know, the, the neighbor? And she was teaching me that by helping others, that's how you cure if you're feeling a little down. And, and so I, I just, uh, I just came back from giving a workshop on, on, social, uh, on social business at the University of Pennsylvania where I went. And I told them, I told all these MBAs, I said, you know, it's okay to make a lot of money and to be really ambitious. But remember, you know, your real happiness is going to come from finding your purpose and finding a purpose that's bigger than just about you, you know, helping others. And that's what the story of EcoFilter is. And I think that's why we've been very successful, because we've attracted a lot of people, you know, especially our managers, um, that believe in this, you know, and so they believe in helping others. And so you don't have to manage them, you know, they all self-manage, because I put the purpose, is a million families, so they all know that that's what we need to, that's what we need to, uh, that's what we need to focus on. And, um, and, then, and, that's, and then, so that's Ecoculture, that's, that's, my, uh, that's my channel today. Um, I, I, uh, I invite all of you, especially you since you're at Diwenyo, um, we have um, constant tours to the factory. Um, and and I op I've opened up the factory to, to the world and to Guatemala because sometimes in Guatemala you have to show an example that you can touch for people to believe it. And if people see it, then hopefully they'll, you know, in their spare time or outside of their office hours, develop these little social ventures that I think will be very important for helping Guatemala. So, thank you. Thank you.